In this video, we are going to talk about lipids. Lipids contain many nonpolar carbon-carbon and carbon-hydrogen bonds, and they will contain few polar bonds, but they will be water insoluble overall. They are defined by a physical property, and this is unlike how we defined carbohydrates when we were able to define them by the presence of a particular functional group. So for carbohydrates, they had hydroxyls and either on hydroxyl groups or either an aldehyde or a ketone. But for lipids, the physical property here is that they are going to contain a lot of nonpolar carbon, carbon, and carbon hydrogen bonds. They're going to be water insoluble. And therefore, lipids are going to have a range of functional groups since they are not defined by a particular functional group. We can categorize lipids into two broad categories, the hydrolyzable lipids and the non-hydrolyzable lipids. In this video, we are going to talk about triacylglycerols, sometimes taught, uh, uh, termed triglycerides. The reason we're going to talk about only these lipids is because these are the energy storage molecule. And since we are interested in understanding metabolism, the, these are the uh, lipids that are going to be processed in metabolic pathways in order to generate energy. So, um, but this doesn't mean the other ones aren't important. You can see in non-hydrolyzable lipids, there are some familiar words here, which are steroids, fat-soluble vitamins. Um, those are going to be very important as well, but they will not be covered in this video. Phospholipids are also another important uh, class of lipids. Those are uh, present in cell membranes. Um, but again, we will not be covering that in this video. So let's talk triacylglycerols. So in order to understand how triglycerides are formed, we need to revisit our Fischer esterification reaction. Because it turns out that in order to make triglycerides, um, we will have to understand these uh, reactions. Okay. So recall that in a Fischer esterification, we reacted a carboxylic acid with an alcohol. In this case, we are showing ethanol. Reacts with an alcohol. And then how the reaction went is this OH was removed, this hydrogen from the alcohol was removed, and then this oxygen could form a bond with this carbonyl carbon, and we would end up with what we call an ester. And again, the ester functional group is this group right here. We also formed water as a byproduct, and this is because the OH and the H come together in order to form water. Okay, so that's what the Fischer esterification reaction was. Turns out with uh, triglycerides, we are also going to have an alcohol, we are going to have a carboxylic acid, and we're going to make an ester. It's just the type of alcohol we are going to encounter is going to be a glycerol. So if we look at our glycerol molecule here, we see this is carbon one, this is a skeletal structure, carbon two, carbon three. And at each one of those carbons, there is a hydroxyl group. This is why this glycerol is going to function as our alcohol in this esterification reaction. Then we're going to have this other group called fatty acids. We're going to talk more about fatty acids in this video, but for now, these fatty acids, what they all have in common is that they contain a carboxylic acid group, which is this one here. And then this is going to be bound to an R group, which is gonna contain many carbon, carbon, and carbon hydrogen bonds. All right, so fatty acids, the reason they have the, the name acids in them is because it has a carboxylic acid functional group. So what's going to happen is this OH will leave, this H will leave, they'll go on to form water, and then this oxygen from your alcohol can bond to that carbonyl carbon. And that's what's being shown here. And this is how we can form the ester. Okay, so your fatty acids are going to be your carboxylic acids. Now, because your glycerol molecule has three hydroxyl groups in it, that means that you can have each one of these OH groups reacting with a carboxylic acid. And that's why you can have three carboxylic acids reacting with your glycerol, or three fatty acids. And that is how you get these three ester groups here. Okay, And each one with their own um, R group. Sometimes it can be uh, useful to visualize these triglycerides in this type of block diagram where your glycerol molecule here is kind of like your backbone you can think about it that way and that glycerol molecule lives right here in your triglyceride and then everything else which is coming off of this r group here those are going to be your fatty acids and there are three fatty acids because you have three hydroxyl groups in your glycerol that reacted with three different fatty acids Okay, so let's look at these fatty acids just a little bit more deeply. What are these uh, molecules that contain this carboxylic acid functional group? Well, these uh, are all of the fatty acids that we 
uh, will encounter. These are the most common ones. They are listed here with their common names, so it is not an IUPAC naming, but the common names of these fatty acids are, are often used. So what you'll notice that is in common from, in all of these uh, fatty acids is that, of course, they all have that carboxylic acid group, which is what's going to react with our glycerol molecule to make the triglycerides. So the fatty acids are a component of these triglycerides. Another thing you will notice is that they all have long carbon hydrogen chains, and some of those chains are going to contain double bonds, sometimes just one double bond, sometimes many double bonds. So now let's look at how these carboxylic acid containing molecules or these fatty acids react with glycerol. So here they are asking us to draw structures of a triacylglycerol or a triglyceride. Those two things mean, two words mean the same thing. Formed from glycerol, which is a requirement. You will always have glycerol in your triglyceride. Then they're saying we have one molecule of steric acid. This is going to be the common name for one of our fatty acids. And I'm showing that fatty acid right here. Then we're going to have two molecules of oleic acid. Again, this is going to be one of my fatty acids, and I provided that structure here. Now they're asking me to bond steric acid to the secondary alcohol of glycerol. So let's visit our glycerol molecule in a little more detail. If we look at the first OH group here, we see that that OH, uh, that the carbon that bears that OH group is bonded to just one other carbon. So that means that this OH here is going to be a primary alcohol. And then the same thing is going to apply to the OH at the bottom. If we look at the OH group in the middle, this one here, first identify the carbon that bears that group, we see that there is one, two carbons bonded to this carbon. That's going to make this a secondary alcohol. All right. So what this means is that they want us to bind bond steric acid to the secondary alcohol. So steric acid is shown here in red. That's this one here. It's got a long carbon hydrogen chain. And then the oleic, which contains that double bond, is listed here. So how does this look when we actually react it? Well, this OH group is going to come off. This H will come off. And then this oxygen will bond with that one. And that will happen with every single one of these, where that will create a bond there. And this will create a bond here. So when we do that, this is what your final molecule will look like, where we have the steric bonded to the secondary alcohol here, that's shown in red. And then the other two molecules are bonded um, in, the, in the other primary alcohols. And this is what a triglyceride looks like. It is composed of three fatty acids bonded to a glycerol molecule. And when you uh, make a, a triglyceride, there is going to be that ester functional group here. All right, let's do one from scratch. We're going to draw the skeletal structure of the triacylglycerol that could be formed from gamma linolenic acid. So I've provided that fatty acid here, and this is what its structure looks like. So a requirement is always that you have glycerol. So if we're making triglycerides, we need glycerol in there, plus three fatty acids. In this case, those fatty acids are going to be gamma linolenic acid. So first, let's start out by drawing our glycerol molecule which looks like this. I have three carbons, each one bearing an OH group. So now with my fatty acid, this OH group is going to come off and one of my H's from my hydroxyl groups is also going to come off. What this means is that all of those H's are going to come off in order to bond to that fatty acid. So I'm going to erase that so that then I can draw in my fatty acid chain. So, so far I have drawn in this carbonyl group there to form the ester. Now I need to draw in the rest of that fatty acid chain. This fatty acid chain contains a total of 18 carbons. Okay. And then you have to make sure that you draw in your um, double bonds at the proper positions. So if I start counting from my carbonyl carbon, that's one, two, three, four, five. This would be carbon six, seven, eight, carbon nine, 10, 11, carbon 12. So when I get to each one of those, I'm going to draw in a double bond. All right, so since I have already drawn in one bond or one carbon from my carbonyl carbon, I'm going to now go to two carbons, three, four, five, six. Now that I'm at six, there's a double bond here, seven, uh, six, seven, eight, 
9. At carbon 9, I have a double bond. So now I'm at 10, 11, 12, another double bond. 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, 18. So you're going to do that for each oxygen here, and then you will have made your triglyceride. Right, so now I have a triglyceride that is made up of three alpha linolenic fatty acids. Linolenic fatty acids. And that is how you can form a triglyceride. All right, let's look at fatty acid structure and nomenclature just a little bit deeper. Right, so here, what we just finished doing here was making a triglyceride. Now what we want to do is talk a little bit more about each individual fatty acid and just how we, we can uh, communicate about them. Okay, so fatty acids are carboxylic acids with long carbon chains, as we've already talked about. So what this means is that a fatty acid is going to have a hydrophobic portion and it's going to have a hydrophilic portion. The hydrophilic being the one that contains the carboxylic acid group since it has that electronegative oxygen in there. And then the tail, which is all carbons and hydrogens, that is going to be hydrophobic. Fatty acids can either be saturated, meaning they have no double bonds, so it's completely saturated, or they can be unsaturated where there's at least one double bond. You're going to notice that when you have double bonds, these double bonds are going to be in the cis configuration. That's because that is the configuration for naturally occurring um, fatty acids. So with this in mind, because fatty acids can be either saturated, meaning no double bonds, or they can contain double bonds, that means they are going to have different physical properties and also different chemical properties. Let's talk first about the physical properties. Let's talk about their melting points. Let's start by looking at saturated fatty acids. So if we look at the number of carbons in each of these fatty acids, we can see that they're written in increasing order. So this means that the mass increases in that direction. So mass increases. So as the mass of your fatty acids increases, the melting point also increases. And this is consistent with what we have talked about already in this course, uh, when we talked about intermolecular forces, where the boiling points or melting points of uh, compounds, the heavier they got, the more mass that they had, the more, the higher the melting or boiling point was. Okay, so here, this is consistent with what we've seen in the past already. But now let's compare that to unsaturated fatty acids because now we have this extra element where we have carbon-carbon double bonds. So let's just consider the uh, unsaturated fatty acids that have the same number of carbons, which is these here. They all have 18 carbons, but what is different is that the number of carbon-carbon double bonds increases in this direction. And if we look at the melting points, the melting points actually decrease as we increase the number of double, double uh, of carbon-carbon double bonds. So what this means is that the more double bonds a fatty acid has, the lower its melting point will be. So that is summarized here. As the number of carbons increases, the melting point also increases. And this is when you have, especially true, when you have no double bonds, no carbon-carbon double bonds. However, as the number of double bonds increases, the melting point is going to decrease. Okay? And we're going to see in a few slides why that is the case. For unsaturated fatty acids, we can classify them as omega N acids. So this is only for unsaturated. So if we have an unsaturated fatty acid, as I'm showing here, you can see that there are two um, double bonds in this one up here. There are three double bonds here. But how we classify these types of fatty acids is we start to number the carbon chain from the very end. So not from the side with the carboxylic acid group, but rather the other end. And we start to number that one, two, three, four, five, six, until we get to that carbon that bears that that uh, carbon carbon double bond. That first carbon is the one that is going to get the omega designation. So when you have an omega six fatty acid, what that means is that the first double bond is located on the six carbon from the end of the fatty acid. We can look at another example down here, linolenic acid, which is an omega three acid. What that means is that the first double bond in this fatty acid is located in carbon number three, starting from, from the tail end. All right, let's apply what we've just learned. Let's order the following fatty acids by increasing melting points, okay? 
four is going to be the highest melting point, one is going to be the lowest. So in order to do this, I would first advise to start by counting the number of carbons in each one of your molecules. Because again, the more carbons you have, the higher that melting point will be. You will then also have to consider the number of double bonds. So let's do each one at a time. So let's first look at the number of carbon, and then we're going to look at the number of double bonds. Okay, so the number of carbons, if you count your carbons in this first one, here, what this means, this parenthesis, is that you have 20 CH2 groups, so you have at least 20 carbons in there, 21 and 22. So there are a total of 22 carbons in here. In the next one, if you count your carbons, make sure you count the carbonyl carbon and then count it all the way to the end of the tail. Make sure you count this last one here. If you count that, you are going to get 22 carbons. If you do the same thing for the other ones, this one will be 20 carbons. This one is also 22. Now let's count the number of double bonds. In that first one, there are no double bonds. It is all CH2 groups. In the second one, there's one double bond. Here, there's also one double bond. And this, there's also one double bond. Okay, great. So now we need to think about which one is going to be the highest. We could start there, the highest boiling point. The reason for that is because I'm recognizing, uh, melting point, excuse me. I'm recognizing that these are going to be unsaturated fatty acids. Therefore, these are going to have a lower melting point than a saturated fatty acid. So immediately I know that my saturated fatty acid must have the highest melting point. So that means this is going to be my highest. Now I need to decide between the other three unsaturated fats, which one is going to be um, next in line. So from the three, we are going to notice that Two of them have 22, carbons of 22, and the other one has 20 carbons. So the one with the fewest carbons, if I'm just comparing these three with, with uh, double bonds, the one with the fewest carbons is going to have the lowest melting point because not only does it have a double bond, but it also has the fewest carbons. So that means that this is going to be the lowest between those three. So it gets a number one. Now I need to decide between these two. They both have 22 carbons, and they both have a double bond. But what you'll notice is that this double bond is different. The configuration is different here, where the configuration is cis, since both are on the same side, as opposed to this one, where one R group goes up and the other R group goes down, or down and up, whichever way you want to think about it. Um, and what this is going to be is a trans configuration. So what you'll notice is that the, the break in your chain is different than uh, in, in the cis configuration than in the trans. So in the trans, this is going to be more similar to a saturated fatty acid. So what this means is that this one is going to have a lower or a higher melting point than one that has a cis configuration. Okay? And it's because of the way that they are going to stack together, which we will talk a little bit more. All right, so then here, this is going to be a two. This is going to be three. Because between those two, the one, the trans fat, this one, the trans configuration is going to be more similar to a saturated fat and therefore it's going to have a higher melting point than another one that has a cis configuration. All right, let's write the lipid number description of each fatty acid. So we want the lipid number description, and then we're also going to state its omega designation. So the lipid number notation is just uh, this ratio here, where the C is going to be the number of carbons, D is going to be the number of double bonds. This is just an easy way to describe the type of fatty acid that we are looking at. Okay, so in the very first one, if you count all of your carbons, make sure you start by counting this one here and you count all the way through until you get to your carbonyl carbon. That one is included. When you do that, you're going to see that there are 17 carbons. And then if we look at the number of double bonds, we see one and two. So that's going to be two. And that's it. That's all the lipid number description is. We, we do the same thing for all of them. We're going to see this one has 16 carbons, and then it has three double bonds. The next one has 20 carbons, and there are no double bonds present, so we write a zero. Now, the omega N designation or classification, this is only going to apply to saturated acids, fatty acids. So that means I have one, two, three. This is located at the third carbon from the tail, so this is classified as an omega-3. The next one is one, two, three. Well, this is also an omega-3. 
And that is how you can classify your unsaturated fatty acids. Okay. Now let's go back to talking about our triglycerides. Okay, so up to this point, just right now, we were talking about the individual fatty acids in this, in each one of these uh, triglycerides. But now we can bond three fatty acids to a glycerol to form our triglyceride. Now, note that your triglycerides can be either simple or mixed. All this means is that it can either have the exact same uh, fatty acid attached to each uh, hydroxyl group. Okay, so you can have three of the same fatty acids, or you can have mixed fatty acids where maybe two are the same and one is different, or two are different, um, or all of them are different. Okay. So simple and mixed, they can exist in either, in either format. All right, so now let's talk fats versus oils. So when we have saturated triglycerides, meaning triglycerides that are composed of all saturated fatty acids, meaning none of your fatty acids have double bonds in them. When your triglyceride contains saturated fatty acids, they make up most of animal fat and they are also solids at room temperature. So a lot of the fats that you consume from fats, they are going to be mostly saturated. And that's why when you have butter, which comes from, from animal fat or lard, also animal fat, you're going to find that they are solids at room temperature. And this is because their fatty acid chains are completely saturated. So what this means is that, yes, they have a high uh, melting points, but they can also, because of their configuration, because of their structure, they can stack together and form these um, solids at room temperature. Okay, it's favorable. That is in contrast to when we have unsaturated fatty acids in, in a triglyceride, which introduces these kinks. We call them kinks. This here, this is a kink in the chain. So what happens is that with these kinks, unlike the um, saturated, so this is a saturated fatty acid, these do not have kinks in them. So what this means is that when you do have a double bond, that is going to bend that, that saturated fatty acid, and therefore your triglycerides won't be able to pack together like they are able to do so when everything is saturated, like in this figure here. Right? So these can all kind of stack together as sheets into a solid. But when you have a kink in your chain, this is not going to allow these triglycerides to stack together into a solid. Therefore, you're going to find that unsaturated um, triglycerides are referred to as oils, meaning they are liquids at room temperature. So what you'll notice is that if you have olive oil, for example, olive oil has a pretty high content of uh, unsaturated fats. And you'll notice that it is a liquid at room temperature. And this is because it contains carbon-carbon uh, double bonds, introducing this kink in that in that fatty acid chain, uh, making it a liquid at room temperature. Okay, so since we have covered a lot of different terminology, I wanted to use this example here to kind of clarify all of those terms. So we're going to select the descript descriptive words that apply to the following molecule. All right, so the first choice is fatty acid. Is this a fatty acid? Well, it turns out, yes, that it is, because I see that I have a carboxylic acid group here, and I have a, a long carbon, 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 hydrogen chain. So this is descriptive of this molecule here. So we do have a fatty acid. Right. Now we have monoglyceride, diglyceride, and triglyceride. We didn't talk about mono and di, but we did talk about triglycerides. And remember that a triglyceride is when you have a glycerol molecule bonded to three fatty acids. Okay, so we don't have a triglyceride because all we have is just one fatty acid in this box here. So none of those will apply. Now we have to determine if this is saturated or unsaturated. This is going to be an unsaturated fatty acid because it contains double bonds. Lastly, we have to determine is it monounsaturated or polyunsaturated. It's going to be polyunsaturated because there's more than one double bond in your fatty acid chain. So this means this is going to be poly. Now, is it omega-3 or omega-6? Well, it's actually going to be neither because if you number your carbon starting from the tail end, you're going to see that you have that first double bond in the nine carbon. So this would be called an omega-9. So it's neither of those two. So these are the three descriptive words that we would use for this molecule. All right, the last thing we're going to talk about in this video is hydrogenation, which is a reaction that we have already seen as well. Okay, so triglycerides can be hydrogenated, but let's recall what that means. 
In hydrogenation, we started with an alkene, so something that contains carbon-carbon double bonds. We added H2 to that alkene, and then we basically converted that to an alkane, where we were, a we were able to add H2 across that double bond. So now, with triglycerides, we just finished covering that triglycerides can contain fatty acids that have double bonds in them. Okay, maybe they can have one double bond, they can have two double bonds, they could also be saturated. Okay? But in this example, we are going to hydrogenate this triglyceride. What that means is I'm going to add enough hydrogen in here to remove all of those double bonds. What's going to happen is I'm going to break one of those double bonds, and then I'm going to add hydrogens to each of those carbons. So when I do that, I'm going to go ahead and draw that over here. Now, the triglyceride that I have is going to be completely saturated. So now I can write this in condensed formula. So this is one carbon, two, three, and then there are three more carbons in that CH2 group. So this means I can write this as CH2. Now I have a total of six carbons. So one, two, three, plus these three here, and then a CH3 group. I can do the same for the other ones. One, two, three, because remember this double bond is leaving and these are going to become CH2 groups. So if I have three CH2 groups from before, now I have one, two, three more. That's going to give me six. And then in the last one, same idea. This becomes, I remove one of those bonds. I add hydrogens here. This one will also be removed. So I have one, two, three, four, five, six CH2 groups as well. and then a CH3 at the end. Okay. So this is what we mean by hydrogenation. When you take a triglyceride that contains unsaturated um, fatty acid, you can actually convert it into something completely saturated. Here I am saturated. Okay. Here I was unsaturated. So when you do hydrogenation, you can go from an unsaturated uh, fat to a saturated fat. Okay. And this is actually a process that we do um, in order to improve shelf life. So a lot of times when we have unsaturated fatty acids, we will do what is called partial hydrogenation. So it's not complete hydrogenation, but we remove some of the double bonds in order to improve its shelf life. Because recall that those double bonds are reactive. They can react with oxygen. So when we remove those double bonds, we can prevent uh, food from spoiling on the shelf because it won't be reactive. But with partial hydrogenation, what can result is trans double bonds. So when we don't remove all of the double bonds, meaning it's only partial, there's another uh, reaction that happens that can sometimes result in trans double bonds. And recall that trans is not naturally occurring. So let's look at the sources of fats, and then we're going to compare that briefly with trans. So here we have a saturated fat. This is going to, again, come mostly from animal fats. So butter, um, you know, other uh, ice cream, milk meats, those are going to have a lot of saturated fats. Our unsaturated fats, which are um, very good for your health, uh, particularly because the polyunsaturated, so polyunsaturated fats, those are going to be essential, meaning we can only get those from our food. We do not synthesize them in the body. So it is essential that you uh, consume them in your food. So it's important to have um, polyunsaturated fats in your diet. These are going to come from nuts, avocados, um, and so on, basically vegetables. Now, trans fats are going to come from processed foods. Also, margarine is, is, a, is, a, is processed in order to remove some of those uh, double bonds to improve its consistency. Because also recall that when you have um, a trans fat, it's going to look a lot like your saturated fat in terms of its configuration. You can see here how this cis uh, configuration gives it a different structure than when it is trans. And this trans configuration makes it look more like a saturated fat. And it, therefore it behaves a, a bit more similar to saturated fats. So what this means is that a diet high in trans fats is going to um, uh, be uh, bad for your blood cholesterol because it is associated with an increase in blood cholesterol. So really in your diet, it is very important to try to focus on consuming unsaturated fats, but especially the polyunsaturated, which are um, an essential part of your diet. Okay, let's summarize. So here we talked all about the, the specific lipid called a triglyceride. 
and we talked about how we can form that triglyceride, and then we talked some details about its uh, structure and function. All right, so how do we form a triglyceride? Well, a glycerol molecule is completely necessary. It has those three carbons. It has three hydroxyl groups. And then each hydroxyl group is going to react with the carboxylic acid group of a fatty acid. So you're going to have three fatty acids that can bond to one glycerol molecule. And then that is going to result in your triglyceride, which is going to be a type of ester. So this is your alcohol. This is your carboxylic acid. And then when these two uh, interact together, you form your ester. We also talked about some of the characteristics of fatty acid chains. We talked about how you can have fatty acid chains that are saturated, as shown here in gray, and you can have some chains that are unsaturated. And when you have unsaturated fatty acids, it's going to produce this kink in your chain that is going to render unsaturated fat, uh, fatty acids as liquid at room temperature. While your saturated fatty acids, they can um, stack together into more of a solid configuration. And then lastly, we also talked about how to classify these. There were um, two ways in which we can classify them. We talked about the omega N uh, classification. So we would number it from the end, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. So the omega uh, classification here would be omega nine. And then we also talked about the lipid number description where we would just um, write the number of carbons in your entire chain. In this case, it's going to be 18. And then the number of double bonds. And in this case, it's going to be one. Okay. So these are the things we talked about here. In a separate video, we're going to talk about the hydrolysis of triglycerides. Because just as we talked about the hydrolysis reactions of esters, because a triglyceride is an ester, it is going to undergo those same types of uh, hydrolysis reactions that we've already covered in organic chemistry.